Elon Musk reveals more crucial information on Starship hot staging, Blue Origin is working hard on recovery, and is Stoke Space following in SpaceX's footsteps? I'm Alicia Siegel for NSF, it's Friday the 30th of June, and there's much more to come this week in Spaceflight. This week, we saw Blue Origin testing New Glenn fairing recovery out at the Cape. We first saw the company try this method back in January, but it appeared to have aborted after just one unsuccessful try. For this round of testing, the fairing half was transported to the turning basin near the vehicle assembly building where it was loaded onto a barge. This barge was later towed out to sea off the coast of Florida, where a helicopter hooked it up and lifted it to about 900 meters. Now, This is where things seemed to go wrong during the January attempt. Keep in mind that New Glenn's fairing is huge. It's 7 meters in diameter and 22 meters tall. Flying a helicopter with a huge load like this is no easy feat. After the lift, the fairing is supposed to be dropped and then a parachute will pop out and it will just gently splash down into the ocean for recovery. While this was not achieved in January, it does appear that it all went well during this latest attempt. Later on, we saw the arrival of the recovery ship Go America on Space Coast Live with the fairing half on board, signifying that the operation went well, and it was, in fact, able to retrieve the fairing from the water. Now all that's left for Blue Origin is to try this out on an actual flight of New Glenn and have it come back from space. So do you think they'll attempt this on the first flight, or will they wait until further into the program? Scientists have found proof of the existence of the stochastic gravitational wave background. Now, if that sounds like a mouthful, it's because it is. Let's begin from the start. Gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space-time and were first predicted as a solution to Einstein's equation of general relativity. Now, you probably know this already, but it's always good to take a refresher. The first detection of gravitational waves was made in 2015 through the LIGO experiment. However, the waves that it can detect are only those that are small in size and therefore higher in frequency. This constrains the kinds of events that we can observe to just black holes or neutron star mergers that occur only every now and then. It's long been theorized that the supermassive black holes at the center of most galaxies could eventually come close together, orbit around each other, and then merge. These events would create low-frequency gravitational waves that could then add up together and create a chaotic mix of waves in the background of space-time. This is what is called the stochastic gravitational wave background. So it's as if the universe was a vast ocean, and we're just on a boat within it, and sometimes we're able to feel individual waves in the ocean when they hit us. That's what LIGO does. But this background is like the small ripples that make the boat bob around as we move through the ocean. Since these are much lower frequency waves, their size is enormous. We're talking distances of light years between the wave crests. So in order to detect them, scientists have to use a clever detector pulsars within our own galaxy. Pulsars are like stellar lighthouses. They beam radiation from their poles, and their rotation makes them shine towards Earth for a certain period that we can detect with great precision. Take dozens of these pulsars, observe the period of their pulses for a long time, and you can detect whether the vast space between them and us has stretched or contracted. So this is what the nanograv experiment has been doing for the last 15 years. And while it's not complete with definitive proof, they still have to gather a lot more data, they do have enough confidence to believe that this gravitational wave background does exist. What's more exciting is that the data shows that this background is louder than what was predicted. So this could mean that there might be other sources for the background that scientists hadn't accounted for, or maybe it might just be that they underestimated how intense those waves would be. It's definitely exciting to see a new way to observe our universe and understand it. So here's hoping that we get to see even more exciting results from this investigation. The most populous nation on Earth, India, has become the 27th country to join NASA's Artemis Accords. These accords are part of NASA's attempt to work with other countries to develop and establish what the agency calls, quote, a practical set of principles to guide space exploration cooperation among nations, including those participating in NASA's Artemis program. India's addition is notable as it's the first Asian country to sign the accords that is also developing its own human spaceflight capabilities. The country has been developing the Gaganyaan spacecraft to carry up to three astronauts into low Earth orbit and plans to perform an uncrewed test flight next year. 
Under this new cooperation framework between the U.S. and India, the country said in a joint statement that NASA would provide advanced training to India's future astronauts. India and the U.S. would also develop a joint plan to send an Indian astronaut to the International Space Station in 2024, likely via a commercial crew vehicle. If all goes well, it definitely seems like there's a bright future ahead for India's human spaceflight program. Now let's go over this week in launches. This Falcon 9 lifted off on June 23rd at 1535 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The mission, Starlink Group 512, carried a batch of Starlink V1.5 satellites to low Earth orbit in support of Starlink's second generation constellation. The first stage, B-1069, was flying for an eighth time and landed on SpaceX's drone ship Just Read the Instructions. This mission launched 56 more Starlink satellites into orbit, bringing the total launched to 4,698. The mission also featured the 10th flight of a Falcon 9 fairing hat, an achievement which should not be taken for granted. This Soyuz 2.1B with a Frigate M upper stage launched on June 27 at 1134 UTC from Site 1S at the Vostochny Cosmodrome in Russia. The rocket was carrying the Meteor M number 2-3 spacecraft into a sun-synchronous orbit. The spacecraft is the fifth in the series of Meteor M weather satellites. Along for the ride were also another 42 small satellites that were deployed by the Frigate M upper stage. One of the other launches this week was Virgin Galactic's first commercial spaceflight, finally reaching the goal that the company was created to achieve. Takeoff of VSS Unity under its mothership, VMS Eve, took place on Thursday the 29th at 1430 UTC from Spaceport America in New Mexico. Our own crew from NSF was out there, namely Jack and Doss, to capture the event as it happened. VSS Unity was released from VMS Eve about an hour later at 1528, after being flown up to an altitude of 44,500 feet. For this flight, Unity was carrying six people inside, with five of them from Italy. The two pilots were Mike Masucci, who was flying for a fourth time, and Nicola Piccile, who was flying for the first time. Of the four passengers, one was Virgin Galactic's flight instructor, Colin Bennett, that's one of the six who wasn't born in Italy, who was flying for a second time. The other three passengers were part of the Italian government. Pantaleoni Carlucci is a technical engineer and pilot at Italy's National Research Center. Walter Villade is a colonel and engineer at the Italian Air Force. And Angelo Landolfi is a lieutenant colonel and physician at the Italian Air Force. While this was the first space flight for all three, it won't be the last for Villade, who's set to launch to the ISS next year on the Axiom 3 mission on board a SpaceX Crew Dragon spacecraft. After a 50-second burn of its hybrid motor, VSS Unity coasted to Apogee, during which the passengers got to experience zero-G. However, this was not a joyride. The flight carried 13 experiments on board, covering different fields like biomedicine, thermofluid dynamics, and it also included wearable sensors on the passengers to collect data during the flight. Unity reached an Apogee of 85.1 kilometers and landed successfully back on the runway 14 minutes after being dropped from EVE. This was its sixth spaceflight, with the next one being planned for no earlier than August. Virgin Galactic then plans to start regular monthly flights afterwards. Now, as mentioned before, Doss and Jack were out there at Spaceport America and they were able to record a ton of cool stuff thanks to the access provided by Virgin Galactic and Spaceport America. So, if you're a member of our channel, stay tuned for exclusive behind the scenes content. There's a ton of cool stuff coming your way. And now let's take a quick glimpse at some other stories across space. This week we had an interesting update from Elon about Starship's hot staging. He mentioned that during the sequence, only the center cluster of three engines on the Super Heavy booster will be running, and they'll be running at only 50% throttle. This way, with the ship igniting all of its engines, it should accelerate faster than the booster once it's flying without the ship on top. It'll be interesting to see whether these engines will also be kept running for the booster's flip and boost back burn. I guess we'll just have to wait and find out. Ariane 6 is slowly getting ready to fly, and it has been performing combined system tests ahead of tanking and static fire testing later this year. This week, its vehicle assembly building was rolled back, revealing Ariane Space's newest rocket. But don't get too excited, it's not ready to go just yet. It still needs to perform a lot of testing, and this isn't even a flight model of the rocket. Also this week, we had news of the delay of the return to flight for Vega C. 
Its next flight is now planned for next year after a failed firing test of its second stage occurred on June 28th. In more rocket delays, the second flight of Landspace's Zuka 2 rocket has now been further delayed. We saw it roll out to the pad earlier this month, and it was just days away from launch, but sadly, testing of the rocket at the pad revealed a failure of a second stage release pin. The rocket has now been rolled back to the hangar to fix this issue. It seems like the Methalox race will still be undecided for a few more weeks. Stokespace gave an update on its engine test campaign, indicating that it had been concluded. The engine and heat shield assembly have been shipped back to the company's headquarters for integration with Hopper SN2. Stoke CEO Andy Lapsa also shared a neat tidbit of information about the conditions in which the company tested the engine and the heat shield assembly at the test stand. It certainly seems like the company might be on a good track to perform a flight really soon, so when hop! And now, let's go over next week in spaceflight. A Falcon 9 rocket is set to launch next week with the European Space Agency's Euclid Telescope. Liftoff is scheduled to occur on July 1st at 1511 UTC from Space Launch Complex 40 in Florida. The last Ariane 5 rocket is ready for launch next week with the Syracuse 4B and Heinrich Hertz satellites. The 95-minute window is scheduled to open on July 4th at 2130 UTC. Another Falcon 9 launch is set to take place next week from Vandenberg, carrying a batch of Starlink V1.5 satellites. Liftoff is currently scheduled for no earlier than July 6th. And that's your weekly update of spaceflight news! We'll see you all again next week to recap This Week in Spaceflight.